What they're looking for is what is called hot spots. So they're looking for areas of activity or abnormal cellular activity. So this is when we have individuals that have a metastasis that may be spread throughout their bodies, okay? And this does not tell us, obviously, the origin of the cancer, but it tells us, okay, well now it's actually spread to, say, around the spinal cord, now it's down in the sacral region and the abdominal cavity, so now you can see where it's going. <coughs> okay. Um, Effects of cancer on the body. So what happens here is that depending on where the cancer is located, um, in the beginning or early stages of cancer, sometimes patients may not have signs or symptoms. Um, and even some cancers, if they're caught early enough, okay, they can be treatable. Uh, prostate cancer, for example, if it's caught in its early stages, they do have a, a successful rate, okay, if they can treat it. But sometimes, uh, by the time they catch prostate cancer, unfortunately, it's a little too far gone. Um, because again, what happens here is that sometimes in the early stages, just like we talked about before, when we talk about chronic conditions, cancer, yes, most cancers are chronic, meaning that they do take a little longer to kind of progress and have this disease process. So by the time that this patient is having signs and symptoms, the cancer, unfortunately, is sort of full blown. Um, now, let's talk about the warning signs of cancer. Okay, and I'm just going over a few more slides. I'm getting a little tired. Okay. Um, warning signs of cancer, and they have a nice little acronym here for you. Okay, caution. Okay, and that's a good way to remember that. Caution. Now, I'll go over a few of these, and then we're going to go over warning signs in children, because warning signs in children are different, okay? Warning signs of cancer, this is more so for adults. Change in bowel and bladder habits. One thing that is a number one signal when people have colon cancer is that they have a change in bowel habits, okay? Meaning that, as adults, we pretty much know our bowel habit, hopefully. Okay, by now, and what will happen here is that if you uh, discover that the bile, your bowel habit is different where you wake up in the morning and you have to go or there's constipation, diarrhea, and then not only that, sometimes um, dark stool, very dark stool is not a good sign and that's usually more along the lines of, of cancer or some sort of disease process, um, especially when we talk about any type of occult blood, and we'll go over that a little later on. A sore that does not heal. Please keep in mind that when a person has a cancer um, that's inside of their bodies, what do you think is going on with their immune system? Compromise. It's compromised. Compromise. So keep in mind that any type of healing, even if they have maybe, let's just say for example, a little cut or something like that, it's going to take them a little longer to heal than the average healthy person because the cancer has now attacked and suppressed okay, the immune system. Um, unusual bleeding, discharge, because what happens not only is the immune system suppressed, but we also have a decrease in blood cells, okay, that can occur. Um, thickening, lump in breast, we know for breast cancer, indigestion, difficulty swallowing, obviously if there's any type of lump. Changes in wart or moles for skin cancer and nagging cough or hoarseness, again, if there's any type of lesion in the throat. Children. Children, their little acronym here is... Uh, Children. <laughs> That's easy enough. <coughs> Warning signs of children, children. Now, with children, I just want to highlight some things here. I don't have to read this verbatim. You can read it at home. But a couple of things I want to highlight. Um, when we talk about unexplained weight loss, this can also go with adults. Because sometimes when adults, as you know, go through stages of cancer, they do lose weight. And um, I'll go over that in a little bit. And that's part of what is called the wasting syndrome, okay, that happens with this disease. Um, but another thing that I just want to point out, um, recurrent fevers not caused by infections, okay. Um, what happens here is that because children, their immune system is still developing, what will happen is that they will have more fevers and more of, kind of like infection, flu type situations that may look like just normal things that children have. So if you look at this, say um, increased swelling, bone pain, fevers, um, 
maybe paleness or prolonged tiredness. Some of that just looks like day-to-day -day yeah. infections that children get. They go to the daycare, okay, they come home, they maybe get a little cold from the daycare. Sometimes, as you know, they say kids have what are called, what are called groin pains, okay, bone pain, so they'll have pain in their joints. Kids, what three-year-old doesn't want to walk at times, okay? So some of these things can be overlooked as cancer um, because of the fact that they just look like normal day-to-day -day things. And I'm telling you this because I actually saw this as an NCLEX question. Um, I, I look at a lot of NCLEX books um, when I make my questions for the exam, um, and they say that that's the number one thing, that um, cancers in children get misdiagnosed because of that, um, because it just looks like day-to-day -day infections. <clears throat> Headaches with vomiting in the morning, okay, who, you know, that's another common thing. Now, pain. We all know that pain is something that is definitely a signal okay, that something is wrong. Sometimes we don't want to admit that we're having pain, okay, especially like a toothache, okay. <laughs> we don't want to go to the dentist. But in any event, with pain, um, this definitely is part of the inflammatory process. And what happens that with people with cancer, sometimes they can have pain just from the cancer process itself, or it can be also from cancer treatment, okay, because we know that cancer treatment does damage, okay, and we'll go over that in a second. Um, and the way they just control this is with giving pain meds. That's all they can do. <clears throat> now, this slide goes over, uh, I can never pronounce this word, Cassetia, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, but basically what this is, it's what is called, if you want to put here, just write out wasting syndrome. This is what we call wasting syndrome. So what happens with wasting syndrome, these individuals, because they're going through this disease process of cancer, what will happen now is that they will lose their appetite. That's unfortunately part of the process. They will have an increase in metabolic rate, which obviously will make them you know, lose weight even faster. And they do have nausea and vomiting. Okay, what happens also with cancer patients, they do have a lot of GI problems. Um, sometimes the GI problems come from the cancer itself or sometimes from their treatments. <clears throat> now, the immunosuppressant, we're going to go into that in a second. Now, what happens here also with cancer, as I told you, um, we said that they do get immune suppressed. So immune suppressed means across the board bone marrow suppression, which means any cell that is secreted from the bone marrow is going to be decreased. And then what happens is that they do have other conditions that come from that bone marrow suppression. So person with cancer could have an anemia. Anemia, as you know, is a decrease in red blood cells. Leukopenia, which is a decrease in white blood cells. And then thrombocytopenia, which is a decrease in platelets. Okay. Now, a person with an anemia, say for example, you have a, a cancer patient and you know that this person is now having an anemia, what other types of conditions could follow from their anemia? Or what type of signs and symptoms could come from their anemia. What happens with people with anemia that are anemic? They're tired, very good. They're tired a lot. Um, yes, as the blood sort of thins a little bit, so to speak, but they're extremely tired, okay? Um, when we talk about a person that has a leukopenia, decrease in white blood cells, what is the first sort of complication that's gonna happen from that? They stay, they, they stay sick longer, the immune system, but what, what, what do you think they would have an increase of? The common, like the common colds. Or, the or common infections. Colds. Let's say common colds, infections. So these people will now be more susceptible for infections because they do not have the uh, proper amount of white blood cells to fight them. Okay. Um, and thrombocytopenia. Okay. What happens here with thrombocytopenia, these people do have issues with blood clotting, okay? So it is not unusual that cancer patients will bleed, okay? They may have bleeding, and as you know, especially certain cancers, um, you know, do have more bleeding than others, but they do have bleeding. And sometimes, depending on how aggressive the cancer is, they can have a life-threatening type of bleeding, like a hemorrhaging. Um, and possibly go into a shock or, or something like that. So that could happen. 
Um, now, I'm going to, I think I'm stopping at this slide. One other thing I just want to go over. Am I almost done? I don't know where I'm at. Okay, okay almost. Now, one thing I just want to point out here to sum this slide up cancer attacks rapidly dividing cells that are in the body. Cancer attacks normally rapidly dividing cells in the body. So, from your common knowledge, what are the most common rapidly dividing cells in the body? Hair, very good, skin, epithelium, skin, and blood, blood cells, very good. So hence the reason why they have the bone marrow suppression and the other reason why these patients do have the hair loss, okay, we all know chemotherapy does the damage on that too. But keep in mind that they will also have sometimes skin lesions, okay, so sometimes cancer patients will have skin lesions because it will attack the rapidly dividing cells and just kind of suppress it and cause a lot of issues at the epithelial level. Okay, so that's just what I wanted to say to sum that up. Now, we do have different types of cancer therapy. Um, surgery, obviously, um, well, I should say obviously, but sometimes radiation, chemo, drug therapy. Now, surgery sometimes, depending on how large the tumor is and what the situation is. Sometimes people or patients don't particularly care for surgery because what happens as you go in and cut, they kind of have the idea of, okay, well now you're opening up more blood channels and now if we have more blood channels, is it now more susceptible for this cancer to spread? Uh, yes, possibility, okay? So it's sort of like a catch-22 there. Now, radiation therapy is used, as I told you before, to pretty much attack the vascularity around the tumor, so it's supposed to kill those blood vessels, whereas chemotherapy is used to decrease the dividing cancer cells. Okay, so I'll repeat. Yes? Um, how come, like, a tumor's blood supply is physically cut off? Like, they don't just cut the... Um, they can't physically cut it off because with angiogenesis, it's not just like one little vessel, it's like tons of vessels. Um, so um, when you think about, and even when you guys did anatomy and looked at how the blood, like, you know, arteries and veins, and then how you have all the different uh, branches and anastomosis and all that good stuff, so it looks like that. So there's so many branches and things around it that they really can't just go in and just cut off the blood supply. Uh, they would either have to take the tumor out but even if they were to cut off the blood supply, um, blood vessels are actually thin enough that they can regenerate. So what they want to do, the whole premise here is to try to radiate and kill it completely. Um, sometimes just cutting it off at one point, it may continue to grow again at the other end. So they want to just try to kill it completely by radiation. Um, so let me just repeat, radiation is definitely there to kill off the vessels and kill off the vascular supply, whereas chemotherapy is used to decrease the number of cancer cells. And keep in mind, we know cancer cells are rapidly dividing. <coughs> so it's there to kill off the cancer cells. As you know, sometimes the chemotherapy and radiation, sometimes they will use this together, okay? Um, we'll talk more about protocols of cancer when we get to leukemias, but um, I'll give you an example. I have a friend of mine that or a neighbor, I should say, when he used to live in New Jersey, he had colon cancer. Um, and colon cancer is a little tricky because he started out with back pain. And he says, oh, I need to come to your office, get an adjustment. He's thinking it's just his back. Come to find out, he was obviously having changes in his bile, a bile, excuse me, habits. And also, um, what happened, he went, got tested, and unfortunately, he got diagnosed with colon cancer. What they did with him, they gave him chemo, and radiation, he had surgery, and after surgery they went and still back, but went back and did more radiation, okay? Because what happens is that, and you will see this as a protocol, they will usually do radiation definitely after surgery because they want to make sure they kill any sort of undetected vessels or cells or whatever that may have been missed, okay, from the procedure. So that's usually the protocol most of the time with um, cancer. Now, other treatments they have here, immunotherapy and some other um, molecular type and stem cell therapy that are, are 
not as commonly used, but they do um, use them for some cancers. I had a patient that her uh, brother, unfortunately, was diagnosed with a chordoma. Chordoma is a very rare cancer, and that type of cancer is um, comes from the embryonic cells. And so, uh, and what happens is that this type of cancer is so uh, tricky the way it behaves. So, do we have still embryonic cells in our bodies as we get into, as adults? No. But what happens is that this cancer started through as through his embryonic cells and through embryo, and then what happens, it just slowly progressed into this actual chordoma. Uh, chordomas are actually extremely difficult to treat. Um, the regular standard chemotherapy and radiation is not good for a chordoma. Um, but they do have some sort of, um, as they say, the emergent therapies that they use for that. Okay, so that's just one example why they would use some of those things for some of those. Um, Wait, he had cancer as? Well, what happened is, is that <laughs> the cancer, not that he had it, but what happens is that, keep in mind that it's an altered gene expression. Right. So this altered embryonic cell stayed with him. So if you want to say he had it as an infant or as an embryo, possibly, if you want to look at it that way. But unfortunately, that altered gene expression stayed with him, and then it pretty much came out at that age or whatever. And I think that's how it behaves. It doesn't come out until you're a certain age or something like that. It's a strange cancer. Is yeah. there any testing? Like, is there any sort of testing? Not that, that I know of. It I, will I don't, show that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know the genetic part of that. Um, there could be a testing for it. Um, just like you know the, um, who was, uh, just like with the breast cancer, um, Angelina Jolie, she was able to get testing to see what were her chances of getting cancer. So, People can get certain types of tests to see what are their chances of getting type, type, certain types of cancers. Um, that may fall into the category, I don't know. Because that's such a rare cancer that I don't even know if they have a test for it. Um, I'm not sure even what type of tumor marker comes from that type of chordoma. I'm not sure. But um, some people can get you know testing for certain cancers. Yes? Yeah. What is the targeted molecular? <coughs> Targeted molecular therapy is, what they'll do is they will use certain molecules or let's say, how can I explain? There's certain types of things that they can make up kind of in a lab, okay? Mm -hmm. Sort of like, I remember they said that they can treat certain viruses with a bacteria, which kind of, you know, is a little funny. <laughs> But it's sort of like that. Uh, I don't know the whole premise behind it, but it's sort of like, okay, well, we can make up a virus that will attack the cancer cell or something like that. Okay. So it's more like uh, using a molecule, molecular therapy, that is ma it's man-made, so it's not a natural type of therapy. Um, and then stem cell, you guys already know what they do with stem cell transplantation. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and the rest of this you can read on your own, which is what I just explained to you. Oh, okay, which yeah. is surgery, radiation, oh, surgery. Surgery. or, you know, okay. Good to go. All right. Now. Oh. <laughs>